Hello, my name is John Baldwin, and I'm here to talk about uh, writing custom commands in FreeBSD's DDB kernel debugger. So I'm going to start off by talking a little bit about what DDB is, and kind of, I, I guess, I'm give an introduction to it. Um, then I'm going to talk a little bit about what the execution context is like in DDB, because if you're writing a custom command, you're writing a function that's going to run inside of DDB, and there's some kind of special rules around what it's like to execute inside of DDB compared to the rest of the kernel. Then I have, I have a couple of uh, demos we're going to go through kind of building up. And the first one is just kind of very simple commands using DDB's built-in kind of command line syntax that it parses for you. <clears throat> then we'll talk a little bit about how you can write commands that can parse arbitrary syntax. You can work directly with DDB's kind of parser or lexer to kind of accept more syntaxes than what it defines. Uh, and then lastly, I'll give an example where you can define kind of namespaces of new commands, what DDB refers to as command tables. And so for example, um, one of the drivers I work on, we define a new table that we put all our custom commands over just to kind of have them neatly organized. So first of all, what is DDB? DDB is an interactive kernel debugger that's included in FreeBSD and some of the other BSDs. Um, it runs on the system console, so either a serial or a video console. That's something you kind of just directly interact with the way you would interact with GDB inside a terminal. Uh, when DDB is active, it interrupts system execution. Uh, there is, for example, uh, with the kernel variant of GDB, there's a way that you can analyze the system, but it stays running. Uh, but DDB is always going to pause system execution and freeze all the CPUs from doing anything while you're using it, kind of like when you attach GDB to a user land process and you're able to examine what's going on. So in that sense, it is somewhat invasive because you have to pause the system while you're messing with it. Um, to the best of my knowledge, DDB was developed in mock originally, because that's what all the licenses say. Um, and it looks like it first appeared uh, kind of in the BSDs as part of the 386 BSD port. Um, but the Detailed history of 386BSD is somewhat unclear, so it's, it's, as far as I can tell, it showed up at some point during that timeline, and that's how it eventually made its way into FreeBSD. Um, as a debugger, it does provide some run control, so you're able to do things like single step, you can set breakpoints, uh, you can even set hardware watch points, which can be kind of nifty. And then it does provide the ability to examine things, but its ability to examine Data structures in particular and memory is somewhat simplistic. More or less, you can do hex dumps. Um, but you can't, for example, pretty print structures. It doesn't understand type information in the way that GDB does. Um, and so that makes it somewhat limited that you, you can look at a hex dump or a dump of memory and then try to intuit the structure layout yourself and kind of walk pointer chases, chasing by hand and so forth. And that's, that's doable, but that can be rather painful and tedious as well. Um, and it does give you a pretty simple way to look directly at a system after a panic, and that's probably the most time that DDB gets used, honestly, is right after a panic, you want to kind of uh, get a quick snapshot. In some cases, the stack trace alone, if you're doing development, kind of tells you where you're going wrong, and it's quicker to go ahead and get that and look at that than it is to get a crash dump and then wait for it to reboot and fire up GDB on the crash dump and kind of look at all the details. And that's kind of the most common use case for it. Um, but then the last thing about it that we're primarily here to talk about today is it does, it is extensible. You can define new commands, and in fact, you can even write commands in inside a kernel module that you can add dynamically at runtime and even unload to remove them. So you could even, in theory, iterate on commands, like on a running system by like writing a set of commands, building a kernel module, loading it. Oh, that didn't quite do what I expected. Unloading it, uh, modifying it some more, and kind of iteratively develop your custom commands that way inside a kernel module. So now let's talk a little bit about what it's like to run inside of DDB, and so what you need to be aware of when you're writing the code that runs inside a custom function. Um, so it is part of the kernel, so it it's kind of has all the uh, rules you might have in the kernel, such as you don't have a lot of stack, so you know, don't be making assumptions that you can have large local variables. But it has some additional constraints besides just that. For example, you really cannot block or sleep. The scheduler is not running in DDB. Um, you're, you kind of, you're borrowing the current thread that happened to enter the debugger, but you're not really able to do any real scheduling work. The system is really paused, and so you need to do very simple things that don't involve trying to do complex scheduler activities. If a fault occurs inside of your command while it's running, DDB will kind of recover and go back to its main parsing loop. 
And the way that this is implemented is that DDB calls set jump before it calls your command function. And if anything goes wrong and we fault, we long jump back out. So one of the implications of this um, is there is no notion of cleanups, or you can imagine like how pthread has pthread cleanup push or pop, or in C++, you have objects that will have their destructors run if you throw an exception that crosses uh, stack boundary. There ain't none of that in DDB. So anything that you might have done that had side effects, like, oh well. Like, you, there's no way to kind of gracefully recover from that. Uh, another thing is that DDB uses a kind of slightly lower level version of the console than it's normally used in, in the kernel. In particular, the kernel console will also log stuff to syslog, so it ends up in varlog messages or wherever else you route kind of your kernel console. And DDB doesn't do that, generally speaking, because that involves a little more synchronization work. So as a result of these rules, there's kind of some guidelines or best practices to follow when you're working on a command. Um, so the first one is you really should try hard to avoid side effects. And that, you know, that kind of goes back to the long jump thing. Um, there's no good way to recover if things go sideways while you're trying to walk a trail of pointers. Um, so you kind of need to be careful and try to avoid doing things that are really going to change state unless that's what your intention of your command is. Um, and you also should really not use locks um, because, again, you could, if you uh, lock something and then you fault, you're going to leak the lock because you're not going to have a way to recover and unlock it. So, like, that's also disturbing state, you should avoid that. If you really have to do this, then you should use try locks because you can't block. Um, one example, I guess, of a command that breaks many of these rules and uses try locks uh, is a, many years ago I added a command to kill a process. And so use at your own risk, but it will try lock the process and kill it, which in very, very limited cases means you can recover by breaking into the kernel and kill mining some process that somehow has hosed your entire system. Um, and in general, aside from things like that, uh, you should avoid complicated APIs because they get you tangled up on all sorts of these things. If you're calling complex APIs, likely they're going to require locks. They're going to be making side effects to the system state that can't be unwound correctly or safely as things go sideways. Um, and usually the most common use case for custom commands in DDB are effectively to be pretty printers. Uh, most of them are working around the fact that you can't print a struct nicely like you can in GDB when you have debug information. So they basically are kind of hand-built custom routines to print, pretty print a structure or details about a structure. So you have routines to print things about stretch proc for processes or things about uh, objects that live inside the virtual memory system like VM object or the list of V nodes that are locked or things like that. Um, one of the other use cases though and the one that is kind of particularly useful for DDB compared to things like uh, GDB, and in particular you cannot do on a crash dump, you can only do live, is you can also pretty print information about hardware state. Um, so, and I've used this on, a, on occasion. So, um, for example, previously I have added, when I was working on x86 interrupt code, I wrote a bunch of little commands that would pretty print state about the picks. Um, both the local APIC and kind of how we had allocated our cookie cookies and which IDT vectors inside of each local APIC we had routed them to so that I could dump that table and kind of look at it to find mismatches. Um, or also information about the picks themselves. So if for some reason you have a bug in interrupt routing, which we don't usually have nowadays anymore, um, or many years ago we used to have, you could maybe see an interrupt was asserted in the pick um, when you were missing an interrupt for a device and you could find which interrupt was being asserted versus the one that, that the device thinks it should be getting. So you could kind of debug uh, routing issues. Um, so one of the most commands I wrote recently that was committed to the tree was actually very similar to this. Um, I had some colleagues at Cambridge that were working with a software that ran on a, for RISC-V, ran on an FPGA, and the software has a, an ARM hard core that's kind of a management core for the software. Um, and there are some devices, so for example, the serial console for the RISC-V core was kind of managed by the ARM core, um, and there was interrupts propagated from the software to the hard core, and they had a problem where the interrupt for the serial console was not working, and we were trying to narrow down where this problem would be, so I added a command to dump the GIC for the arm that prints out a line per pin so you can see which pins are masked or not and if a pin was active that was masked that would kind of indicate that perhaps there was a problem with the routing or the FTT they had published and it turns out it wasn't that. It turns out in their logic they, there was a, I think a bus that was three pins wide that carried the interrupt number and somewhere in their logic it got truncated to one pin um, and that's how they lost the interrupt and once they fixed that it was all fine. But we could use that command to kind of narrow down where to look. Was it a problem with the FTT? Was it a problem in the logic? So that's a, a kind of a use case. 
of something that you can do with DDB that doesn't, it's not quite as easy to do with, with GDB, and it's not quite, and it's definitely something you can't do post-mortem because the hardware state is gone post-mortem. Um, so one of the other guidelines, I guess, uh, is that there is a custom API that you should use instead of printf for outputting things from DDB, um, which is so the next thing I'm gonna dive into is kind of what is that API. It's not very thick, actually, it turns out it's quite thin. Um, mostly it consists of the fact that there is a different printf that, that you, you, must, you should use, uh, db printf instead of printf. And that uses that lower level console I mentioned earlier, so it uh, is much more simple, talks directly to the console driver and that's it, um, and avoids any kind of synchronization that way. So it's a lot like printf, takes the same arguments, um, and does direct console access. One little thing that, that, that db printf does have is, is it has a built-in notion of a pager, um, which the other half of it, so when you are printing something out to DDB, it will kind of trap new lines and notice and keep count of how many new lines it's done, and based on that, drive some very simple logic around a pager to avoid spamming the system console with a bunch of content. Um, and one of the options you have, uh, some, it has built-in logic to handle things like single spacing or a page at a time, but it also has a way to quit and abort a command, and when that happens, it sets this global variable DB pager quit. So if you're writing a command that loops, to be a good citizen, you should check this command and break out of any loop you have if this, if this variable has been set. And I have an example of that later on. So I've kind of mentioned that the way these commands work is they are, um, they work by writing a C function, and when you invoke a command from DDB, it's going to call the C function, and that's where your logic all has to live. Um, DDB supports kind of a general syntax out of the box that most commands use, which is up here. It's also in the man page, um, which is you have the command name, you can have an optional modifier that's prefixed by forward slash, you have an address most of the time, and then you can have an optional count after your address. And the address is optional, although most of the time you get it. Um, and then what your actual command function looks like is that you're going to call a function with this signature. So you take an adder arg, um, that basically corresponds to your address, a have adder, a count, and this modif thing. And so each one of these pretty much maps to what you see in the syntax. So adder holds the address to operate on. If, it's, if there's an explicit address, it holds that. If there's not an explicit address, uh, DDB maintains kind of an implicit address of whatever the last command operated on, similar to kind of GDB does, and that's what it will be. Um, and have adder tells you if an address was given, so you can choose whether or not you want to require Address is always and kind of treated as a syntax error if one is not provided. Um, and then the modifier is just this string of optional modifiers without the leading slash. And finally, the count is there if it was specified. If the count was not specified, it's given as negative one, which is how you can tell if it's present or not. And then to kind of declare these function, we have some helper macros that wrap a little bit of this logic. So it's slightly, some syntactic sugar to make it slightly easier to define new commands. Um, and they do a couple of things. They define um, <clears throat> a helper structure, and it does say linker set. It's actually more accurate to say that nowadays we define a couple of sys -inits to dynamically register your command with DDB when your module is loaded or when the kernel is booted up and to unload it if you unload the module. Um, and we also declare the actual function for you and expect you to kind of put the function body directly after the macro. And you'll kind of see what this looks like in the examples that I have coming up. So the first one is just db command. And so I have an example here. Um, and it takes two arguments. The first one is going to be the name of your command that you will type in kind of when you're using the DDB interpreter, and then the name of the C function that you're going to define. Um, so in this case, we're defining a command named foo, and the function that we're going to define is called db foo command. For example, you usually don't really care or need to know what the function is called, but if you want to disassemble it in the debugger or find the symbol for some reason, because you're debugging weird toolchain, crazy nutsiness, then you know what it is. Um, we also have a couple of other wrappers for this that work with kind of some built-in command tables that DDB has. We have a DB show command that defines commands that, are, that live under a show kind of prefix. So in this case, this example defines a show bar command that's gonna call a C function. And we also have a show all. Um, that holds things that, and, and the intention is that show commands, generally speaking, are going to show information about a single object. So for example, show proc takes a PID or an address and it's going to tell you information about a single process. Whereas show all procs, which has a shorter alias of PS, is going to loop over all the processes in the system and print information about each one. Um, and then uh, 
the function name pattern that I'm using here, which is to kind of have a db underscore prefix and an underscore cmd suffix, that's, that's kind of common convention, mostly common, not always followed convention, um, but it's not required. There's nothing that kind of, and there's nothing in the implicit macros that we use, for example, that really assumes that's there. So here's my first example. Um, and these, all my examples are toys, because I'm trying to demonstrate like the parts that I care about, not complicated logic in the C part. Um, so this defines a new little command called double, that um, if you give it a number, it's going to print out twice the number. Otherwise, it's going to tell you that you didn't give it anything. And so we can show that. And I'll, I have it at the end, but I've, I've written, I I've, have a little git repository with all these little commands in them if you want to look at them later. So first I'm going to start a VM. Yeah, not that one. And while that's booting, we'll get ready to log into it. And I'll build my little kernel module here that has my new commands in it. And then I'll load it. Um, in this case, I'm not going to panic my system because that would be gratuitously painful. Um, so there's a syscuttle we have. We have a couple of syscuttle helpers um, for the debugger that you can force the debugger either. You can force a panic if you're willing to test that or force page faults or things. Um, most useful for debugging the code that unwinds across the stack across the page fault. Um, but we also have a helper one that will just enter the debugger nicely for us. And when we're done, it will come back out. Yeah. OK, so now I'm in the debugger. And the command we defined was double. So first, I'm going to show what happens if you just give the command. And then if you remember, it winds at you and says, you didn't give an address. So that works correctly. And then if I give it a nice little number, it's going to print out twice the number. So that's all it takes. If you want to have a simple, simple command, it takes some kind of number or a symbol address. Um, there's, you, know, you have adder, and you can just do whatever you want with adder. You can cast it as a pointer, for example, if you need to in your command. All right. Let's go back to So that's a simple command. Um, it just has parsing an address. Um, so the next thing, and I'll get the mouse cursor off my screen, because that's annoying. Um, the next thing I'll talk about are if you have a command that wants to do something slightly fancier, maybe you don't want just one address, you want to support more than one, or you want to do something that's not an address, you want to handle some other kind of arbitrary string. So there's two flags that you can set kind of in the metadata that's associated with a command to say that you want to, do, you want to have some level of additional control over the command line parsing as a command function. Um, the first one you can set is cs underscore more. And this command, this flag means that you take an address, you, you kind of follow the normal syntax, but you can take additional arguments after the, the original syntax is over, kind of as an option. And then the second flag you can set is cs own, which means that you're going to, as a command function, you're going to completely own all the parsing yourself. You don't want DDB to parse anything for you, you want to do it all by yourself. Um, and you can, there are kind of new, or variants, these are in head, and it's a little more painful in older branches. But in head, we have extended versions of all the DB command macros I showed you before um, that are variants with underscore flags that take the flags as an additional third argument. Um, and if you're going to do this in your function, one of the kind of contracts that you take with ZDB is that after you've finished parsing the command line, you're supposed to call a helper function called db skip to EOL that, just, that kind of flushes the lecture state to kind of discard all the tokens up to end of line. So when, when, we're there, when we're going to parse things, there's a couple of functions that you can use to interact with DDB's parser. Um, the first one that's mostly useful if you're using the CS more mode when you want to parse additional words is DB expression. And that's going to kind of start chewing up and eating tokens from the current pending command line to evaluate an expression. And this will do full expression syntax. It will handle the different operators that DDB supports with their different 
um, priorities, it handles symbol res resolution, um, and things like that. Uh, if, for, so if it runs directly into end of line at the very beginning, so that there's no more stuff that happens, it returns false. And if it successfully uh, parses an expression, it returns true, and the expression that it parsed is returned in the value you, your argument points to. However, if there's an error in your, like I said, it runs into a syntax error, it prints a little message and then triggers and, and, and aborts the command, effectively doing the long jump back out to the main loop. Um, so this is one of those little gotchas that if you're using DB expression, you have to know that, like, if you follow the general rule of not having side effects, that's helpful, but it's kind of be aware that this thing will just magically long jump out from under you if the user gives bad input. You know, there's nothing you as a consumer can do about that. Um, another routine that you can use if you're, in particular, if you're not doing CS more and you really want to do the more low level parsing is DB read token. Um, and DB read token works directly with the lexer that TDB uses. And it returns um, a T foo constant. The constants all follow this pattern of a lowercase t and an all uppercase. And they're, they're an enum that's not an enum. They're defined as just pound defines. Um, and there's several values of these. Most of them related to operators that the expression handler uses that you don't have to care about. But the two that you probably really care about um, are t ident, um, which parses a C identifier. In particular, it's not just an arbitrary string. It has to start with an alphabet or a, a, a letter and then only contain valid characters in C uh, identifiers. And if, it, if this is returned, then the actual string was saved in a global variable db underscore token underscore string that you can then access inside your function. And the other one that's kind of meaningful is t number, which means that we parsed some valid number that could be an octal or, or decimal or hex, and we've saved the value of that number in db token number. And um, then one final function that you probably won't use in most cases um, is db unread token. Um, in particular, uh, sometimes if you're writing something very complex, like an expression parser, you may need to use this, where if you're expecting some set of tokens, um, but you have the ability to continue to be valid if you don't get an expected token, then you may want to use this to kind of push the token you just got back that you didn't expect back onto kind of DB's lexer stack, and then allow your, your parent code that you return to to deal with that new token in some way. So then another thing you need to do when you're inside these functions is you need to be able to handle errors now that you're parsing um, your own syntax and you've defined kind of your own grammar for what your commands do. The simplest way to do this, although a lot of the commands in the tree don't currently use this, is a function called db error. And db error just takes a simple uh, C string. Um, it prints it out if it's non-null. If it's null, it doesn't print out anything to the console. Um, and then it completely flushes the lecture state and triggers a long jump back out to the main loop. So it, Again, and if you have any side effects that you need to undo, uh, you need to do them before you call db error because you don't get a chance to continue after it. The other alternative, if for some reason you don't like the long jump, is you can call db flush lex specifically, uh, which completely flushes the lecture state and throws away everything that's pending. So now let's look at some examples of using uh, these two options. So the first one I have is an example that's using CS more, and I think it's a, it's a sum command. So sum is going to take an, like an arbitrary list of numbers, you have to give it at least one, and it's going to add all of them up. So we're just calling while db expression in a loop and waiting for that loop to end. Uh, once we have finished kind of dealing with parsing all the words that we've gotten, well, I guess we should say first, notice that I have to figure out do I handle not having a word at all. In this case, I'm going to require a word. Um, and then my first word is already implicit, so I have to pull my first word from adder. I, I don't, like the first word's already done for me. And then I use a while loop with db expression to handle additional words that I'm going to parse. And then once I'm done parsing, I do the db skip to eol to kind of get DB, uh, ddb's lexer into a good state to handle the next line of input. <clears throat> and then finally I can actually do what my command is trying to do, which is print out the sum of the numbers. And then I have one more I'll show, and then we'll actually go run these. Um, so the second one, is the font's a little smaller as the code gets bigger. Um, this one is actually using CS own, so we're doing our own parsing entirely. In this case, uh, this is a command, it's kind of a toy command, show soft C, that takes a name of a new bus device, kind of a device in FreeBSD's kernel, and as a string, and then we'll look up that the, the, point, the, the kind of device T for that object by name, and then print out the soft C pointer. Um, Printing out the soft C is not 
necessarily amusing, but several of the commands I've written actually take a device name and kind of use this pattern. Um, so first I'm going to read a token, and if I didn't get a C identifier, because device names are more or less follow the same conventions as C identifiers, then I complain because I don't know what you gave me. It, you gave me something that doesn't look like a device name. Uh, then I'm going to try to look it up to see if it's, also, if it's valid in the system, and then I'm also going to go ahead and take this opportunity to flush the Elixir at this point. Uh, and then if it failed to find a device, I'm going to complain again to say I didn't find whatever device name you gave me. It's a valid, like, lexical name, but it's not a device in the system. Um, and then once that's happy, I will print out um, the pointer. I'll call device get, get soft seal on the device and print out the result. So we can show the examples of these. Oh, I guess I actually hadn't exited the debugger. Um, so if you remember, I think the first one is sum. So again, if I do sum without anything, it whines at me. If I give it just one word, right, it knows what that is. But if we add more, it parses each one as an expression. Um, something I didn't try beforehand is presumably you could try to use C's expression or the parser that the expression parser that DDB supports. We'll see how fancy that gets. Ah, I did the right thing. Yes. So. It'll just parse and eat up arbitrary words and then allow you to sum them. Uh, the other example I gave was show soft C, I think. So let's see. Uh, my laptop. So if I just do show soft C, I get the one error, which is I didn't say anything. If I give you something that's like a number, then that's not valid. But if I give you a valid device name, like uh, I should have ACPI on this laptop since it's made in this millennium then there's a pointer to the soft C structure for ACPI zero, if I wanted to find that for some reason. Where did I put my one? So the last topic, well, any, before I move on, I guess, any questions? I can always go back to the code later if y'all are curious. All right, so the last main topic I have is you notice in that case, um, my second command was a show command, so it lives under the show table. And I kind of alluded to the fact that it can be convenient maybe to define your own kind of tables, your own namespaces of commands, especially like as a, as a device driver, you may want to kind of have your own set of commands that live under your kind of name for your device. So um, you can do this. Uh, DDB command tables, for example, like show, it's actually a command in DDB. It just has a special handler that knows that it takes a, instead of kind of parsing an address and doing something, it's associated with another table of commands that it kind of parses the next word to index inside of. Um, so they use a special function, DB show table, that's the handler for the function. Um, they also have a global variable that they, or not necessarily, well, a variable of type struct DB command table, which is really just a list head, because the, the, the command tables are stored as a uh, simple link, double link list of objects. Uh, they're not currently in FreeBSD quite as well abstracted. You kind of have to look at some of the internal macros and how they use and abuse some of the internals to get it to work. So maybe if other people really care about this at some point, we can make the, the macros a little nicer and easier to use. But today, they just kind of like a little grotty. But I have some examples to show what it looks like. Um, one of the things you have to do is just like something like syscuttles, you have to kind of plug into the tree somewhere. So if when you define a new table, it has to be a child of some other table that already exists. And the three tables that we already have in the system is uh, the DB command table is the, the top level table of, of top level commands, and then we have the tables for show and show all. So here's uh, an example, um, which I've defined for my little demo module. Um, I have to find a new kind of demo top level command that's going to be my table, and these subcommands are going to live un inside of, under, under demo as it were. So this is the grotty part. Um, I have to define this DB command table object, which is really a list head, and I need to initialize it. Um, and so in my case, I'm going to use a static initialization versus trying to use a sysinit to do it. Uh, then, some more grottiness. I have to use this internal uh, macro db underscore set uh, that actually kind of creates the sysinits to register in the data structure to register the command for demo. Uh, and in this case, uh, the command is named demo. It's going to use uh, the demo command table as its function. 
and demo table is the name of the global variable that holds the things, or, or holds the list of, of new commands. Then for each command that I defined, uh, I also, I don't have quite like a, I could perhaps, probably if I were doing this for reals in something production, I would define some local like db demo command that wrapped this underscore db func, similar to how we have db command and db show command, but for, for having fewer lines in the slide, I didn't do that this time. Um, so in particular, uh, the first token is kind of a, similar to syscuttles, is the underscore and then the name of my table, the name of my command within the table, um, the C function, so for example, the, the kind of wrapper functions that we currently have kind of only take these two arguments. Then the table I belong to, this would be flags such as CS more or CS own if I took any, um, and then this should always be null. What this argument actually is, is when you're a table, it's the pointer to the table. So I have all that blob to basically define a single command named one that's gonna print out one, and another command named two that's gonna print out two. So now we can show that. So if I just run demo, just like if I were to run show, it's going to tell me that you're, this is a command that takes subcommands and prints out the list of subcommands that were required. And so in this case, we have one and two. So if I run one of those, it's going to run the little toy function that I had. All right, and I lied, I have one more example. Um, so the last example I have is something that's going to show you kind of interacting with the pager and um, I basically took charge in from inetd and made a charge in inside of ddb because I needed an excuse to have a lot of content, a lot of output. Um, but I didn't want, that will not fit on a slide in a way that is readable. So I've elided most of the code. Um, so this is kind of, but in particular, I want you to see the main loop. Um, and then at some point in the main loop, we print out a new line. And then every time we print out a new line, we're gonna check to see where, did we get a request to quit, which is how we can cope with quitting if the user asks us to. So that's, that's the only part of this slide that really matters is seeing that we added these two lines in the right place. We go back to our demo. I think I named it charge in. If I run charge in, it's gonna give me the nice output. Um, I believe if you hit enter in DDB, it does one more line. So for, if you have a lot of output and you want one more at a time, you can do enter. If you get space, you get what DDB considers to be a screen full, um, which is the defaults to 24 lines, there's actually a special variable in DDB dollar lines, it's how many lines it thinks it is, that if you want to change it, you can. Um, but the real thing I'm trying to show here is if I hit Q, then that returns, it sets that DB pager quit and my helper function notices and behaves and is a good citizen and falls back out um, without printing forever in an endless loop. Okay. So, um, in conclusion, uh, most of the commands that you would probably want to write if you were working with DDB um, and actively developing something, um, most of them are pretty printers and they take kind of a pointer to a structure as that address argument and they work with that. In some cases, you may want to take some other token that's not an address, in which case you probably have to do something like CSOwn to deal with that. Um, there are lots of examples in the tree if you just grep for db underscore command or you grep for db printf, you will find ones that do all sorts of various things. And, that, and that's probably the best way to find other patterns and examples beyond the little toys that I showed today is to go find some examples in a tree. Um, if you want to see the toys, you can find them. There's a really tiny GitHub that has them uh, available there. And then questions. Yes. Yes, so I guess I should. Um, yeah, so for the stream, um, Christoph asked, can you define uh, modules and a kernel module? And so I, for this talk, I actually did so, and so I, I can continue the example to show that. So I don't know if you remember, um, over here I had actually compiled my custom, it's actually a little module that I have. So if I actually continue out of here, I'm um, back to running, back to running on the system. I can even unload the module. And it doesn't go boom. I can go back into the debugger. And now my commands are gone. 
So that was what I said earlier, you could actually iterate. So if we wanted to um, modify one of these commands in some way that I had, we could do it on the fly, load it. Like you could replace an existing command you had named. It doesn't care because they just go away on unload and you can re-add them on, on load. So definitely you can do that. Tom? Uh, is there, Tom's question is, is there a reason I shouldn't use this uh, on simple kernel drivers? So I will, I will give you a larger answer to your question. Um, I use DDB rarely. Um, my preferred debugging experience is to use GDB just because of the flexibility that I don't have to write a pretty printer if I need to examine something I don't have. So when given the opportunity, I, I use this when I have to, I guess. Um, my probably ideal environment for working on a device driver is using pass-through into a VM um, to pass through the hardware and then using kind of a, some kind of debug stub inside the hypervisor if it's functional enough, um, or using like GDB over serial over a null modem connection into the VM if I have to, to debug that way. Because that gives me a richer debugging experience for device driver typically than it would if I were having to kind of make do with this. But there are some cases where you can't do that. So the example I gave earlier of um, my colleagues who are building this little RISC-V core and they need to run a very tiny little memory file system kernel image thing on it and they don't really have a good way to try to connect to nested remote GDB inside the kernel then like, or in particular it wasn't even for the RISC-V core, in this case it was for the ARM hardcore. Um, in that case, having using a, a kernel that's resident inside the debugger itself was just a simpler approach to deal with. So I, I guess to answer your question, you could, uh, it's one of the tools that's available to you, and I guess one of my points here is like, if you, this is an option you can use, and if you want to use it, this is how you can use it. Uh, but it doesn't necessarily mean that it's the best tool for any given instance of a job. Yes? Uh, so, uh, I mean, it depends on how dangerous on the edge you want to live. I mean, so you can do some things. So I mentioned, so I guess I should repeat. The question was, is it safe to do things like uh, network I.O. Um, or is it just kind of console access? Um, so I mentioned earlier that, A, you probably shouldn't do that. <laughs> but it's true that there are things you could maybe get by with if, you, if all the stars are aligned and you've made them all aligned versus things that will just not work at all. Um, if you wanted to use our network stack out of the box, it does too many things involving context switches and so forth that that wouldn't work. But that does not mean you couldn't do something else that was built to kind of run in this execution environment. So for example, one of the things that was contributed back from Isilon to FreeBSD in the last couple of years is we have the ability to kind of have um, a debug network stack in the way that we have a low-level console that you can use in the debugger. And this is used to allow you to actually do GDB over a network connection, kind of that's kind of pre-configured and you've arranged kind of what your IP4 address that you're going to use and the routing details have been kind of set in the kernel ahead of time. Or you can actually even set them from DDB itself if you get a panic. Um, and also to support sending dumps across the network instead of writing them to local disk. But this does require um, explicit support in the driver that you're going to use to kind of have a separate path of routines that kind of can deal with not with only pulling and not trying to expect interrupts or dealing with context switches and so forth. Um, and it's not, not dissimilar actually from how we have a custom path-ish in storage controllers to deal with crash dumps so they know to do pulling and not kind of interrupts and so forth. So you could do some complex things if you want to, um, but in many cases you may have to do a lot of work to get there because you may have to duplicate things or provide alternate services that depend on polling, for example. Any other questions? Oh, go ahead, Bjorn. Yeah, so I, I well, while writing this talk, because I'm actually the guilty person who added DB pager quit like maybe 20 years ago. Um, so Bjorn's Bjorn, uh, question for the stream was that um, in his experience, there are some commands that don't actually honor the pager correctly. Uh, so it occurred to me during my talk that now that I have a better view of what would be perhaps a more consistent design, uh, it, it may be worth revisiting the pager quit to just be another long jump. 
Um, it's a really forceful way of not requiring cooperation. And, and maybe I'll actually go back and do that and just remove the global variable and just say, you get long jump. Please don't do side effects. Because <laughs> um, there's so many other places that will already do that now, it turns out anyway. Kirk. So most of my scripts, which are somewhat hackish, um, are really revolve around GDB and not DDB, to be honest. Um, and I do have, uh, well, this might be awkward. Let me figure out how to get a Safari tab open on the right display. All right. So. Will you do the right thing? No, you will not, but that's okay. So I do have a set of scripts that I have developed over several years um, that work with GDB, and I have a GitHub repository that I keep these things in along with some other stuff. Um, so uh, can you see it? So under my old GitHub place, there's a kdebug that I have repository, and it has a couple of different things inside of it. Um, a few dtrace scripts that may or may not be interesting, um, but then most of the kind of fun bits, I guess, are some GDB stuff <clears throat> written in old uh, GDB's internal scripting language and not in Python, sadly. Maybe someday I will retrofit some of them into Python because that would be a good use of time and a, and a better thing, set of things to use, but they didn't work with GDB 6.1 on FreeBSD 4 <laughs> and FreeBSD 6, which is when I started using these things. Um, in fact, you can see um, the two main scripts are actually called GDB 4 and GDB 6 because I, I, this was when I was at Yahoo, um, and it's when I started these, and they pull in, they, they define commands specific to OS versions, and GDB 6 actually has a bunch of version if defs in it to handle things from 6 through 14. Uh, and then it, we, I have some architecture-specific ones, like I have helper scripts that will walk page tables and kind of print out the PTEs if you're trying to debug stuff and all sorts of arcane weird crap. Um, but they're, uh, they're documented by reading. Um, <laughs> that's about the best way that I could put it. So it's, uh, uh, it's accessible for someone who wants to use it, but I don't really have it easily consumable by people who aren't already kind of hacking the kernel a lot. Say what? Yes, it definitely is that. And I, I believe there are some people who, who have used them, maybe even some people in this room who have used at least some of them in some form or fashion. So I think Mark has some nice scripts that he might have done in Python that might, I don't know if they fully duplicate all the work. I think they do some of the work nicer. Um, he has a nice thing to deal with VNet because vImage makes um, debugging less exciting. Or, or less pleasant, I guess is the word I would use. And he has some stuff that will actually like take a VNet pointer in the name of a symbol that's a VNet symbol and kind of resolve it for you nice and clearly and with, with some Python helpers. But that's not DDB, <laughs> that's all GDB. And I, I, I must say that my, I spend most of my time um, using GDB for debugging stuff. Um, DDB I use in certain constrained environments where it, it, that's the best tool to use. Any other questions? Okay, well thank you very much.